On today's episode of Dance Med Spotlight, I'm speaking with Kirsten Kemp. She's a former professional dancer, now high performance mindset coach, and founder of The Confident Dancer. She is found online and YouTube, podcasts, Instagram, also one on one coaching, lots of different ways to find her. One of her biggest focuses is helping dancers and dance teachers overcome some of the things that are all too common in the dance community. Things like self-doubt, perfectionism, performance anxiety, low self-confidence, all of these different things. So in this episode, we talk about ideas for dance teachers helping their students become more confident and less self-critical, making better communication available for your students to support them in all of that. We also talk about the dancers, not only things that you can do as maybe little exercises for yourself to work on some of these things, but also what you can do if maybe you're in an environment that isn't as supportive as we wish it would be. We talk about all of those things and a lot more, including some of our own experiences. So be sure to check out this episode. Welcome back to another episode of Dance Med Spotlight, where we talk about all things dance medicine and dance science. Today, I am excited about my guest, none other than Kirsten Kemp. Now, Kirsten is a lot of different things when we start looking at some of your background, so I'll let you explain some of it as well. But history as a professional dancer, but now moving more into this high performance mindset coaching and speaking on all of those kinds of topics. So welcome, Kirsten. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me. I'm always excited to connect with more professionals like yourself, helping dancers, helping the dance community. And I just love sharing ideas that uplift dancers and dance educators. So I'm excited to get into whatever we end up talking about. Yes. And that is the key, whatever we end up talking about for sure. So give us a little bit more about your background. I always kind of ask for the short story version so that our audience knows who I'm chatting with today. Yeah, for sure. Um, Well, short story form, which is always a stretch for me. I love the long story, but to keep it short, um, I trained pre-professionally, obviously (laughs) danced professionally. I grew up in South Texas at a pretty recreational school and then just progressively fell more in love with ballet and started training at just higher level summer programs and like Houston Ballet, San Francisco Ballet, ABT, things like that. And uh, I ended up training year round at the Houston Ballet Academy for two years towards the end of high school went to the University of Utah and graduated with a BFA in ballet there and a minor in business. Um, And then I ended up dancing professionally with the Oklahoma City Ballet, which was a fabulous experience. However, it did get cut short because I had a knee injury that Mm -hmm. uh, was just very, very persistent. And uh, I definitely could have used your help at the time. (laughs) Yeah, because I just it was overuse, you know, the classic dancer thing of now I can see so much of how what was going on in my mind and my emotions impacted my recovery, even from a stress component. Like I was putting so much pressure on myself to get back. I was scared of negative repercussions, not from faculty, but you know, slipping behind and things like that. So I just pushed way, way too hard for too long and ended up needing surgery and all that. But thank God, I can dance again. I'm all good now, but it ended up um, just being the best decision for me to step away from the full-time company life. And that led me into what I'm doing now, which is um, high performance mindset coaching for dancers. I could just say mindset coaching for short. And essentially what I specialize in there now is in helping dancers, mostly through individual coaching, though I do some speaking on these topics as well, but I specialize in helping dancers break through self-doubt all sorts of insecurities, fears, and limiting beliefs that cause us to have low self-confidence, trouble trusting ourselves as performers, trouble putting ourselves out there. There are so many mental struggles that I know I experienced, and I saw so many of my peers going through it too. Like Even perfectionism, Mm -hmm. comparison, performance anxiety is a huge passion of mine for working with dancers on that because it just, there were many points in my journey where I loved to dance. There was absolutely no doubt about that, 
but it was um, the extreme anxiety I had. It was, it was not just nervousness. It was like full blown anxiety I had around performing just because of the extremely high standards I felt I put my on myself and I, I also mm -hmm. was trying to live up to them. And so I understand how much of a mental component there is to not only dancing to your fullest potential, but even if you're dancing to your fullest potential, enjoying that, it's a whole other side to ballet that I just yes. love supporting dancers through. So that's what I'm doing now. That's awesome. And I think, I mean, there's so many little tidbits that you said where I'm like, oh yes, oh yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. But I think it boils down to, I think so often when we're thinking about dance, and this is true regardless of where we are as far as like level of training, where we are in our career, what style of dance we're doing, we often think about the physical side of things, but we don't nearly often enough talk about the mental side and yeah. what an impact that has on everything. Absolutely. Yeah, I think especially after the pandemic, a lot of conversations started to open up about mental health, which is really, really important. Um, and a lot of times mental health as a general topic tends to lead us towards talking about anxiety and depression and all sorts of things that are really more geared towards therapy, which I am totally in support of. There's such an important place for therapy in the lives of every human, but especially dancers. A lot of us go through really difficult experiences or maybe we have um, family of origin troubles that kind of follow us into our mental tendencies and behaviors in the studio. And that's really important to work on with a therapist. And the gap I really am passionate about filling with dancers is that side of it where it's like, okay, <laughs> I'm not in deep depression, not that you have to be to go to therapy. I want to be clear about that. But I, a lot of dancers come to me because they're like, I want to talk to someone who gets dance. I don't want to have to explain the whole weird dynamic that's there. I don't want to have to explain all the intricacies of how weird our dance world is. Because honestly, it's very weird. There are a lot of weird power dynamics and structures that Sometimes if a helping professional doesn't understand that, it can be hard even for the dancer to feel understood enough to really open up or to maybe be receptive to the advice that's being given. So I just wanted to fill that gap of also talking. I don't, for the record, it's out of my scope of practice to treat um, an anxiety or depression um, beyond like situational things like performance anxiety. That tends to be something I can help with. Um, however, there is such a great opportunity for dancers before they get into a really tough place to have someone support them and challenging them on, um, their beliefs about themselves. Like, yeah. for example, I work with so many dancers who have this, um, what they would call imposter syndrome or just this lingering feeling that they're not good enough. And it causes them to hold back in the studio, stand in the back even when they get opportunities, they're scared everyone's judging them because deep down they don't believe they deserve it, you know, things like that. <laughs> and someone like me can come in and say, okay, hey, what are the beliefs around that that are causing you to think and feel these things and maybe behave a certain way, like overwork yourself out of insecurity until you get injured and burned out? Okay, well, we can work on those beliefs. We can change them. I can teach you some different mental skills to handle the pressure focus on things that help you to stay present, grounded in the moment, more confident in yourself and your dancing. You're like, we can work on that before you get into it, like a really deep, dark place. Um, so that's really where I try to come in and help dancers in that place that I just felt like I didn't really see anyone filling that role. Not that there weren't, that I'm not saying there wasn't anyone when I was dancing. I just didn't see it. So I was like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this should be a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's how I ended up doing the stuff I do as a physical therapist. I was an injured dancer. I mean, my listeners have probably heard this a bazillion mm -hmm. times now, but I was an injured dancer in high school. And I went to go see my primary care doc who, you know, was not used to dance stuff. I wouldn't expect them to be. And just told me like, mm, take a break for a while, take some leave, do some squats, yeah. you'll be fine. Like, And that was the extent of the advice given to me. And then 
you know, I kind of figured the rest out on my own, but it was not yeah. the easiest path by any means. Right. I think one of the things that you mentioned and comes to mind, just even, you know, specific examples of past clients or things that I dealt with growing up in dance. Mm -hmm. um, one is when a dancer is injured, yeah. we put so much of our identity into being a dancer and revolving our world around dance. But when that is even temporarily taken away because of an injury, I've had some dancers, young dancers in particular, really struggle with well, what what does this mean now? Yeah. What do I do with myself? Oh, that is so hard. And I also experienced that as you did too. I feel like it's almost a rite of passage for dancers, no matter how you experience it. Maybe it's a boot for six weeks. Maybe it's taking almost a year off and mm -hmm. or longer. You know, we all have um, different things like that that we can relate on. Um, and I've definitely worked with a lot of dancers who either come to me because they're like, okay, I just got this injury and I feel like this is the time where I know if I just go back into the studio, all the same demons are going to follow me, like all my insecurities and blah, blah, blah. So I want to work on this now. And then there are also a lot of dancers who are healthy physically, everything's going fine. And we're working together on maybe resolving performance anxiety or self-doubt or a lot of self-criticism that's getting them stuck in their heads. And then they get injured and our focus changes during our program. So I've seen it so many times. Mm -hmm. And injuries can actually be a really, really good opportunity. And I, I think maybe this is not the expected answer, but I'll say to question our relationship with control and with ourselves also. How do, not only how do we identify yeah. ourselves, where are we getting our worth and our sense of value as a person from, um, but also <laughs> how much do we find comfort in trying to control every little aspect of our existence? That's a very common thing that a lot of dancers struggle with. And it was definitely one of the core features <laughs> of my injury recovery. I saw that the more I was trying to control every little aspect of how long my recovery was and how um, how much I stayed in shape and, you know, doing all the right things to try to control the perfect outcome and get back as fast as possible. It actually prolonged my recovery in some ways because I was pushing myself too hard. Yeah. I genuinely believe that the amount of stress emotionally I was experiencing, which we know increases cortisol. It's like a chemical in the body. <laughs> yeah. That it our body does. does not love. Oh no, no. And it, inhibits your body's healing response. So I had, I yeah. personally had this experience where after I made the painful and hard decision to step away from the contract I had, it was of course like the floodgates were open of this freedom and this euphoria of, oh my gosh, I don't have to have pressure on myself anymore. I can just heal. You would not believe within one month, I go from like barely getting through bar and like Tondu's Adagio and Center, maybe a pirouette too. I'm not saying this was a healthy timeline, but I was feeling so good. I did Grand Allegro. Again, I'm not saying that was a condonable timeline. Mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. At the same time, I just share that to say the emotional component radically changed how I was feeling in my body. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there, there are a lot of dynamics there between the mind and body that we could talk about. Yeah, most definitely. I know also, so like outside of growing up doing dance, all of the typical studio-based ballet, tap, jazz, hip hop, whatever, I now do West Coast swing dancing. So partner mm -hmm. dance. And I compete in it and train in it. And I find that when I go out for the competition floor and I'm just in the mindset of I'm going to have fun, I'm going to enjoy the process. This is my time to kind of have a performance opportunity and that sort of thing. This, this is my show. I yeah. tend to have a better showing, a better competition. Yeah. And when I go out and I'm thinking, yeah, okay, how am I going to place? What if I draw this per person? What about the judges out there? Some of them, I don't know if they like my dancing and, you know, totally get in my head. Mm -hmm. um, then I tend to not do so well because yeah. I'm so caught up in here instead of just letting letting my brain and body and the music 
work better together. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, it's almost like in a way it ties into the control thing. It's attachment to certain outcomes. I've noticed the exact same thing that when I dance and I'm more tuned into the joy of the process, I think we all know this, but to practice it is a different thing. Yes. Um, and we all have days, you know, obviously I have certain tools and techniques and trainings and certifications and blah, blah, blah. I'm still a person. I still <laughs> experience some of these things. So it's totally normal. But when I release the, uh, my attachment to a specific outcome, like this competition or performance will only be good if I don't make any mistakes or if this person likes it or if I get the certain score or something yeah. like that. And it can tend to, that attachment can cause us to be so preoccupied and in our heads that we not only don't have fun, but <laughs> it's just harder to be in that flow where the choreography and all the muscle memory just comes out right have you ever had that experience where you're just like in the flow and you don't even have to think too hard about what you're doing it just happens mm -hmm. definitely and that's like such a beautiful opportunity to get to that place yeah. I think of dance when you can get to that spot is like the ultimate mindfulness thing where mm -hmm. you can just live in the moment that you are in and you're not thinking about what else is happening and who's thinking what and what's happening over there. Yeah. Um, you just, you can focus on what's happening right now. Yeah, seriously. Dance is such a mindfulness exercise <laughs> in a personal development framework too. I've, I've found that mm -hmm. um, dance is this great outlet for a lot of us feel that way. It's an outlet for expression or maybe mm -hmm. it feels like it's just so integral to who we are. And so we just have to do it because we love it. Um, and whenever we have challenges or mental, emotional struggles, self-doubt or getting really in our heads or maybe getting really attached to what other people think about our performance, it's such a mirror, right? Of like yes. what's going on inside of you. It just holds up that mirror and it's like, here's what's going on inside of you. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's exactly. confronting. Most definitely. There's actually a West Coast Swing professional um, who has now been receiving training in the mental health space, and she's doing this really cool stuff, kind of blending the two together. And I remember when I interviewed her also early on in my podcast, she was talking about how she's kind of finding these ties of, well, how are you showing up as a partner in this partner dance? Well, how is that reflecting things in your own life of maybe how you show up as a partner in other ways? And, you know, can we work on one to help the other or can one influence wow. the other? And so it was a really cool idea where it's like even these things that maybe we're struggling with within our dance mm -hmm. do have those ties outside of our dance that we can I think about too. I love that. I love that. Yeah. It's so true. I've even heard of, uh, well, I do have a friend whose daughter is um, basically wanting to get into dance therapy and she wants to turn couples dancing into an opportunity to do kind of couples therapy in a way mm. of working on their connection, their dynamic. And so I love hearing about how people are creatively blending those together to make dance a, a healing thing um, yeah. because it totally has the power to do that. Um, and it can also, depending on how we relate to our dancing, it can also obviously be destructive. Um, but, you know, in that, since it can be whatever we make it, if if anyone's listening who is in a really tough place, maybe you're burnt out, or you just question if you love dancing anymore, or you know you love it, but it just makes you feel like garbage when you're not amazing at it, then there's definitely hope for change. It's all about questioning our own attitude or approach and our mentality to that shows up in dancing. Um, so yeah, that's really cool. I often see that um, oftentimes when I'm coaching dancers, we do get into their personal lives a little bit um, or maybe some of their past that caused them to bring certain things into the studio and certain patterns or beliefs got reinforced in the studio. So since we're holistic beings, it definitely, <laughs> is appropriate that of course it's all connected mm -hmm. 
And I think, you know, we kind of talked about this a little bit where dance is definitely an outlet for us. But sometimes when we're in that space where it's like it's not being productive for us or it's not being mm-hmm. beneficial for us, sometimes taking a break from the dancing also can – like there's that, you know, it's an outlet and so it's a good thing to do, but sometimes we just need a break from it too. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of times when I've taken time off a of dance and I go back, especially for the partner dancing because there's somebody that I'm attached to as I'm dancing and they can give me feedback too. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, what have you been working on on these three months away? absolutely nothing. I, you know, and, and they That's think great. that I've put in other practice, but it's just, I've taken time away. I've let myself get away from whether it's mindset stuff or yeah. weird habits that I've built or whatever, and kind of come forward with a little bit of a fresh slate. Mm. So I find that those times away sometimes are more therapeutic than anything. Yeah, absolutely. It, it really can be, whether it's physical time away or even if dancers just start um, like maybe, maybe a student or professional dancer is listening and they're like, it doesn't quite feel like time for me to step away, but I definitely know I want to change the way I'm thinking and feeling as I show up in dance. Um, There's still different ways to give yourself some mental space or give yourself perspective that helps you to re-enter in a different way. Um, and one of my favorite exercises to help dancers shake up their perspective is to have them write down all of their have tos, all mm-hmm. the things that they feel they have to do, have to be, have to think, have to feel, whatever it is that comes to mind. Because those have tos, a lot of them come from external sources, like maybe their teachers literally said, oh, you can't mess up. You always have to be on. Yeah. Or maybe it's it hasn't been literally said. It's just the feeling that the dancer gets. Like, you know, I have to do this or else, um, or else I'll fall behind, I'll fail, or I'll get in trouble, something like that. Sometimes it's entirely self-imposed. <laughs> no. So writing all those down, I find that it can illuminate so much of where the stress and the pressure is coming from. And in those have tos is really, it's going to show you your relationship with dance. Mm -hmm. So whatever those have tos are, those are basically the rules and the expectations you've been operating from. And what are expectations, if not the source of pressure, not that all expectations are bad. They're not, you know, it's just our little prediction machine minds trying to predict what might happen as a result of a certain action. So we know how to act. So it's not bad, but Mm -hmm. our expectations can really get us into some traps mentally. And from writing down all the have tos, you can then look at it and start to say, okay, which ones are really not serving me? And do I really, really, really have to do those things? I know I feel like I have to be perfect, but do I really? And how is this expectation actually preventing me from feeling the way I want to feel, dancing the way I want to dance? Because ironically, a lot of the expectations, we think they're going to help us reach higher or dance better or be better, work harder. When you really look at it, I bet a lot of dancers will discover that those are actually what's holding them back yeah. from moving forward. Um, So yeah, then whatever we become aware of, then we have more choice about how we want to interact with that thing. Do we want to change the expectation? Do we want to release expectations and instead adopt a focus on our intentions? Like what do I want to, what's a quality I want to play with today in the studio? Or what is something I would like to improve, not perfect, improve? You know, intentions Mm -hmm. are kind of something, a quality you want to step into it's it's a little bit more vague than an expectation and expectation is almost you can imagine it like a finish line or a measuring stick yeah. when i hit this finish line then i was successful so see it's a bit more rigid it's not bad but it tends to be a bit more rigid and intention is kind of like here's the starting line i want to step up to and i'm going to go explore from this place 
and just see what happens. <laughs> it's a bit mm-hmm. more open-minded. So there's a place for both, but especially if dancers listening are, or even teachers, you know, I know I talk yeah. so much to dancers and I can forget they're, like you said, there are all sorts of people <laughs> listening, but sometimes even the expectations we place on our students can they can feel that. And if the expectations mm-hmm. are maybe a little higher than where they're at right now, And there's a fine line with that. Like, yeah, we want to call our students higher, but sometimes they can get defeated if they're continually a little too high. They can just start to feel like, oh, I can never measure up. And it can be counterproductive. So even with your students or with yourself as a teacher, you can do the same exercise. What do I expect of my students? What do I expect of myself as a teacher or um, a professional in any sphere and is that working for me or my students Mm -hmm. can i start to shift that and be maybe a little bit more open so yeah it's a tool i definitely recommend yeah and i think with that it's being aware of some of those expectations or words that you're using or things like that and then taking the time to pay attention to the dancers that you're interacting with listening to them both actually listening Mm -hmm. and paying attention to body language and all of that sort of thing to see, okay, are we maybe kind of hitting a threshold of maybe this expectation is a little bit too high. Maybe I need to, maybe I need to rephrase, dial back a little bit, Mm -hmm. provide them with some success. So they also feel like they've been successful along the way and not just always better, better, better. Yeah. Everything. Totally. Yeah. And I, I took a management class in college <laughs> for my uh, business minor. And I totally walked into that class. This will relate, by the way. <laughs> I walked into this class and I was like, ah, oh, this is going to be an easy A. I'm not planning on going into management. So, but whatever, I'll be in it for the A. I ended up learning so much <laughs> that I still use in my daily life from this class because it talked a lot about human behavior, psychology, organizational mm-hmm. behavior, and leadership dynamics. Yeah. That really gave me new eyes to see what dynamics work in the studio and what doesn't work. And one mm-hmm. thing I learned about was um, how when um, whatever – implicit beliefs or expectations that a leader has of whoever is under them, those people under them will feel it. And sometimes as teachers, we can have this style of teaching where we feel like we have to hold them to a high standard and we have to instill discipline and we have to, in a way, pull them up because if we didn't pull them up, they won't meet us there. They won't try. I've gotten into dynamics like that myself as a teacher, even though I try so hard to be just positive and motivating and all these things. I have found myself in cycles of frustration. Like, how do I motivate these dancers? They just don't seem to want to try. And then I remembered what I learned in this class, which was theory X style of management was um, basically when a leader has this um, belief of in the class, they were called employees, but let's say students that the the people don't really want to work. Like you need to teach them. You need to pull them up. You need to hold them to the high standards. You need to be on them or else they won't want to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. It assumes that they don't have implicit motivation, which I know sometimes as instructors, we can see that behavior in our students. And we have real evidence a lot of times that Susie Q showed up and wasn't trying today. And how annoying is that? Because you're pouring your heart and soul into trying to help this little person grow. And she doesn't care. It's so (laughs) annoying. But then there's the style or theory Y of management, which was, um, I believe it was the implicit belief that people inherently want to work and be better and do better if you give them the space to do that. And so I randomly remember that um, a couple of years ago and I was like, okay, what if I really just, I stopped harping so much on the mistakes, the corrections, the disciplining them and, you know, just being a little overbearing to be honest. And I, I just let them kind of, I let them rise on their own. I stopped trying to force them to rise 
And that looked like me being a little bit no more nonchalant around corrections. And it's not like I wouldn't say anything, but I just started to experiment with being like, okay, I would notice the dancers that I would look at and generally get more annoyed with because I know, okay, this person just keeps doing the same thing. I've told them the same thing for like three years and they're still doing it. I started to just let that go. <laughs> Be mm -hmm. like, well, why am I acting like she's going to change today? Okay, I'm just going to let that go. And then I started uh, responding to, you know, when I would give someone else a correction and just, I would kind of say it with this tone, like, oh yeah, just do this. And I would challenge myself to not over explain it. Or when the dancers wouldn't like really master the choreography, even though I felt like I demonstrated it really well, I was like, okay, we're just gonna move on, go to the next exercise. I noticed that throughout the class, the students really were paying attention. They, mm -hmm. they were like, I, I saw it in their eyes. They were tuned in, they were engaged. I started to notice over time with this shift in attitude of like, eh, you know what? I'm just gonna let them rise. And I'm gonna be just here to support. I'm here to set a tone in the room of, yeah, we can do this. Mistakes, okay, no big deal, but we're gonna keep rising. Yeah. Um, and I noticed they there was a big shift in the room and that class was, it really marked a change in my time as a teacher, because I teach a little bit on the side um, mm -hmm. where I, I noticed a big improvement in that class over the years. So anyway, awesome. I, I don't talk about that often on podcasts, but mm -hmm. it, it just was inspired. I was inspired. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it makes me think, so I'm also a professor in a PT program and we've shifted over time how we teach some of the content. Mm -hmm. And I've been in the same courses basically since I graduated from the program myself as a lab instructor and now course coordinator. But along the way, we went from a lot of, you know, telling them exactly for this thing, this is how we do it. Put your hands here and go along with us. We'll come around and give you feedback to now teaching more of the general concept, having some sort of framework to guide their mm -hmm. thought process but giving them a lot more opportunity to kind of try and explore, yeah. see what feels better on their bodies versus maybe mine because we're built differently or yeah. different, you know, areas of strength or areas that, you know, need a little shoring up and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And what we found through shifting this process, they seem to be so much more confident in their skills. Mm -hmm. And once we get to a certain point where we're having discussions about stuff, they're asking instead of these kind of more superficial questions of just trying to get the basic understanding still, now they're actually able to analyze mm. what they're doing and take it to that next level of, you know, well, if it applied here, what about over here? And let's That's layer great. in this other thing. And it's like so much more complex conversation than yeah. I feel like we had years ago when we had different methods. And so, yeah, it's, it's interesting when you shift your teaching methods a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, giving them that space, what it can do for them, for sure. Totally. Experience is the best teacher a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's why what I've noticed with myself and what I teach clients when, let's say, I'm working just on my own individual dancing is that the more that we can depersonalize what doesn't go well, as in don't assign specific meaning to it, especially not about yourself. Like, oh, pirouette, uh, pirouettes went badly today. I'm a bad turner. I'm mm -hmm. not a natural turner, something like that. If we assign too much meaning to what doesn't go well, it just forms into all sorts of beliefs that end up limiting us and maybe even um, lowering our confidence and self-esteem. And on the other end, when we um, just let ourselves notice what wasn't perfect or what didn't go well, just notice it and let it pass. And mm -hmm. when you do that in your mind, what it also ends up looking like physically as you practice is you're able to kind of just like shake off that it didn't go that well and just put an intention into the next one. Okay, here's what I'm going to try. Here's what I'm going to move towards. And even if you do three in a row and it, it's just not getting better, there's still an, a, an ability to understand that, you know, God willing, there will be a tomorrow and you can kind of move on and reassign your energy to where it's going to be more helpful to you. Mm -hmm. And what is also great on the other 
And you know how I talked about depersonalizing your quote unquote failures. I don't love that word, but it's a term yeah. I've learned. Depersonalize your failures, personalize your successes. Now, obviously this can be taken to an egotistical extreme. And so I'm not endorsing that, but a lot of dancers <laughs> do the opposite. We very much personalize what does not go well. <laughs> and we depersonalize what goes well. Oh, it was a fluke. Oh, thanks. But did you see that other thing I did really badly? Oh, yep. but maybe next time I'll mess up. Um, or I was lucky today. You know, we, we I catch that a lot in dancers self-talk. And mm -hmm. by the way, Everyone, your self-talk is very indicative of what you deeply believe about yourself. Um, mm -hmm. Though we often play it off as jokes. Like, oh, I'm just kidding. Oh, Self-deprecation. I don't really mean it. Really? Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure that. So when we um, personalizing our successes in a healthy way, and you can also model this for your students as well if you're a dance educator listening, um, it can look like, actually taking a moment to notice what went well and maybe assigning some positive meaning to it. Like, look, I did make a positive change or look, I persevered and yeah. that happened or look, that's proof that I'm growing. Notice I didn't say, oh, look, that's proof that I am better than all of you <laughs> and um, you should all bow down to me. That's not what I said. You know, it's more <laughs> like, look, I did that. Or, you know, I am proud of how I am. So um, attentive or persistent or hardworking or creative. Just take a moment to celebrate and assign some positive meaning that gives you a little motivation to see what else you can do. I've mm -hmm. noticed a huge trend with dancers that we think it's our job to focus on what is what we need to fix. Meaning we end up focusing on what's wrong. And that is the strategy we often learn from a young age to improve. It's just the pattern, you know, understandably. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I, I teach dance. I get how it goes. It's not always a horrible thing, but it's so easy to model for students the behavior of give corrections and that's how you get better. That's why it's also really important to mix in praise, specific praise. Mm -hmm. Hey, I saw this in you. This was specifically great. That specifically was a great change. Um, like in getting as specific as you can to give your students brains evidence of what is going well that they can now do more of instead of, Hey, do less of this, change that, do less of this, change that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so we also need to do that for ourselves as dancers. And part of that is um, giving ourselves the space to look at what is going well and actually trust that. And this is, this is true of the brain that it works based off of avoiding pain and moving towards pleasure. A lot of times we focus on avoiding pain. Oh, I don't want to fail. I don't want to fall. I don't want to be judged. But yeah. if you also feed your brain that positive evidence of look, I changed that. Didn't that feel so good? What did I enjoy about that show um, or that combination? Whatever it is, your brain will also start to learn to associate dance with moving towards pleasure. And that helps just as much with improving. It's something that's mm -hmm. really easy to forget. Definitely. One thing that I've interestingly really gotten into enjoying with my swing dancing is sometimes I'll do just like drills by myself and video myself. And so in swing dancing, so much of what we do, it's improvised. Mm -hmm. We have a base technique, but there's no choreography ahead of time. And so I'll just like turn on some music and I'll try a bunch of stuff mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, what if I do this with my shoulders? What if I do mm -hmm. this? Okay. That was a little weird. All right. And you know, and I just try a bunch of different things and then go back and watch and see what felt good, but then also see what maybe looked cleaner, more mm -hmm. polished, like it fit the music, that sort of thing. Um, and I used to hate doing that sort of thing because it is so incredibly awkward um, to do that exercise in the first place and equally, if not more awkward, to go back and watch yourself. But I've yeah. actually like found some joy in embracing the awkward. And in the process, I've found some really cool things where it's like, ooh, what was that that I just came up with? And I watch it back awesome. and I go, okay, I'm going to try that again. Um, and so it's been a fun exercise to get into. That's so fun. And kudos to you for starting to love even watching videos of yourself 
dancing. I know world-class dancers who are famous, who will on record say how much they hate watching themselves dance. Mm -hmm. So it truly has nothing to do with skill level, but it's an amazing thing to start to look at and appreciate the beauty that you have in your own dancing or to celebrate yeah. how cool it is that you can discover new moves and look at what you like and not just what you don't like. Cause mm -hmm. I'm willing to, I'm assuming in the beginning of you watching those videos, you were looking at everything that you didn't like. <laughs> it was, it was just, yeah, it was an awkward and painful process. Yeah. Um, until I kind of had that mindset shift of no, I'm learning something from this process. Yeah. I learned that move didn't work. Cool. I try something else. Yes. Fantastic. That's so good. I think, you know, one of the things here too, when we're talking about particularly from the perspective of dance teachers or maybe artistic directors, anyone who's in that sort of leadership type position in front of a group of dancers is if they're able to facilitate that culture not only does it help the individual dancers with things that they're working on for themselves, some of their mindset stuff, but also makes it more uh, like open for the dancers to support yeah. one another in it also. Like one yeah. of my friends, she's really gotten into a lot of this mindset stuff. And we were talking the other day at a conference and I can't remember what comment was made, but something to me that was meant to be a compliment to me. Mm -hmm. And I was just sort of like, oh yeah, you know, and, and trying to kind of explain it away. And she goes, stop. Can you just receive that for a moment? And I go, okay, <laughs> receive. Yes, acknowledge. Okay. Um, and so, you know, being able to be in that place with other people where you can have those moments mm -hmm. of just kind of like, what's going on right now? Yeah. Hey, let's talk about it. Um, can it be a really right powerful right. thing too. Yeah. It's that, uh, that beloved term of holding space. <laughs> Mm -hmm. it is, it's an amazing thing. Um, I've, I heard once this idea that um, it, it was, I don't take it too seriously because it was someone talking about a study and I didn't read it myself or anything like that, but they suggested basically that it would be helpful for a person, even if they just talked to a, a pole for like 45 minutes a week and just like mm -hmm. shared what's going on, that that would provide some benefit to them. Mm -hmm. And how much more a person, whether it's in a formal setting or in a friendship, when someone holds space for you to witness um, how you're really feeling, what you're really thinking, what you want, what you're afraid of, what you want to change, there's something so profound about that. And I've seen that so many times that obviously there are a lot of things that I guide dancers through and I teach them in order to help them through the transformation that they want to experience, whether that be going from um, feeling like they don't belong or they're not good enough to feeling confident, good about what they have to offer, putting themselves out there, things like that. No matter what the transformation is, I often see that one of the most powerful things is just two things. The fact that dancers, uh, like it does take quite a step to invest in themselves and to say, I'm going to meet with this person for a committed amount of time. And that is a big sign. And it's like a, a step that they're taking that symbolizes their commitment to themselves to let go of what no longer serves them and step into what they really want. So I've often seen that, not that I've ever tested this out for the record, but sometimes I feel like, hmm, even if I did nothing, <laughs> even mm -hmm. if I just sat here, um, I think there's really something powerful to that space yeah. to listen and to, uh, cause when we share with another person, um, it not only invites things out, but we also get to hear ourselves and understand ourselves in a deeper way. And towards usually towards the end of the program, I take dancers through, I see the dancers actually start to coach themselves before I even, <laughs> I even step in to ask a question or make a suggestion or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something really powerful about that. And even more so, you know, when you do have someone to ask you questions that facilitate self-discovery or challenge old ways of thinking or beliefs or patterns of behavior that aren't working um, and help guide you towards solutions thinking and not just focusing on problems. Um, 
Yeah. That alone <laughs> can be really powerful. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Thinking back to our, our teacher friends, mm -hmm. um, we've talked a bit about ways that we can maybe promote the more sort of positive atmosphere where we're being less critical, allowing more confidence, um, maybe helping out dancers who have some of that self-doubt with things. Mm -hmm any other tools that they could try to incorporate into their class? Absolutely. So there's a lot I love to share on this topic. We could really do a whole episode, but I will share one main idea is the power of embodiment. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about embodiment, I really mean that we, through our actions, and even through our unconscious belief systems, we're setting this tone in the room and through the way that we, the, the feeling or the energy we give off. And obviously our inner world determines what we say to the dancers, how we act, how we respond to them, our own, the way that we show up and especially the way that we interact with the students I don't think enough of us think about this, but the truth of that is that we are actually modeling to our students the relationship that they can have with themselves. So I, I'm sure a lot of teachers have heard the idea that we have the power to become their inner voice and for better or for worse, we often do become their inner voice. Mm -hmm. Dance teachers can be very influential in a, in a dancer's life. I've had that experience on both ends very positive and very negative, but even the negative, you know, is a big motivator for why I'm doing what, what I'm doing now. Mm -hmm. um, and so going back to some actionable tips on that, what can be really powerful is to just take a moment to think through how you want, like what, what tone you want to set in the room how do you want your dancers to think about them and feel about themselves? How do you want them to respond to mistakes? How do you want them to talk to themselves, to show up in the room? What impression do you want them to take away of you? Like when they leave the room and they think about Miss Alyssa, Miss Kirsten, whoever, what what kind of thoughts or feelings do you want them to be having towards you? Just starting to bring awareness to these different things can then help you to answer the question, well, how do I want to embody those answers? Or how do I want to embody the relationship I want those students to have with themselves? So some very practical ways that I have lived out that answer to the question myself is, well, the tone I wanted to set is um, like this tone of excitement. Like we're all here to do something and be present and enjoy ourselves, but work. You know, I want dancers mm -hmm. to come in and to be able to not like leave all their troubles behind in like a, a way as if that's not welcome, but rather to just feel like this is a space where we're so present and enjoying the process of the movement so much that you kind of just naturally forget whatever was bothering you and you become encouraged. You see the best in yourself. You see how much you're capable of. That's a big thing. I got mm -hmm. clear with myself that I really want my students to feel and see how much they're capable of. I want to give them the experience of being surprised by themselves every week. So when I thought about how would I embody that, not just through my words, but even through my tonality, my body language, because there was a really interesting um, statistic I saw that I think it was something like, I might be getting the math slightly wrong here to add mm -hmm. up to 100%, but it was something like 55, I have quoted this on so many podcasts, a little, I gotta look this up so I get the numbers right. But basically it was like 55% of communication happens through body language, about, I think it was like 
30 something percent through tonality and it was only about seven percent through words and i catch myself in this bad habit a lot of i love to use my words i will i will explain oh i support you i will give them verbal affirmation i will explain how i want them to change explain the concept the correction whatever and then i realized the most powerful thing i really could be doing is get them in their bodies experiencing the correction and physically help them understand or show them if I can to get them feeling it. Um, or, you know, I realized that though I verbally am so encouraging, at least I think so, that's my intention. Um, I realize sometimes in my excitement, I can, and also just in my stature, I'm tall, I have maybe a more commanding presence and voice. I didn't realize early on in my teaching journey that just my tonality and my body language was so intense that it made certain small dancers feel scared. <laughs> and so I had to start to shift um, my body language and my tonality to complement my words. And I did notice a big change in the dancer's energy. So now when I go to teach some ways that I um, basically help set that tone in, in the space that I talked about is Whenever a dancer makes a mistake, I do my very best to have this response of like, oh, that's okay. Okay, try this. Oh, that's all right. Yeah, no problem. I do that all the time. Try this. Mm -hmm. So it's brief. It gets them towards action. It gets them towards possibility. Like, here's what you can do. And generally, when we focus on what we can do, that builds confidence rather than what we just did wrong, that builds yeah. insecurity. And I don't want to get stuck in like explaining or getting them focused more on the corrections, getting them in their head. And I've noticed just simple things like that, like, oh, it's okay, try this. You can do this. Hey, I saw that positive change. You know what? That's all right. Leave it for tomorrow. We're going to do this. Um, or specifically calling out that was that glee soft was tighter than last week. Look at that. Um, I noticed the energy I bring into the room really dictates how that class goes, which is a big yeah. responsibility. I get that. We're not always going to be perfect, but it's cool. I encourage all teachers to experiment mm -hmm. with it. Any advice? I'm kind of thinking now of some of the dancers who maybe are in environments that are not the most supportive, um, you know, thinking of some of my dancers who sometimes come to me and they go, well, I always get yelled at for this, or I know so-and-so is better than me because it gets pointed out in class, you know, things like that. For dancers in that kind of environment, any advice for them? Hmm. Yeah. So there is a lot I can say because there are so many possibilities in that. Like maybe the dancer feels, you know, there are all sorts of outcomes with that insecurity, yeah. feeling pressure, perfectionism, because they're trying to be perfect to maybe get external validation, whatever that is. Um, but some general things I can say on that is it's never going to hurt you to, um, <laughs> get clear with yourself about how you want to define and measure success. So it's really easy when we don't develop awareness of this to just live your life as a dancer um, in the hopes that you will be successful when the, you're the teacher's favorite or successful when you're the best dancer in the class or successful when you look like the dancer on the cover of Dance Spirit or Point Magazine or whatever or the Instagram famous dancer you follow who's 12 years old and like 500 million times better than you, you know, <laughs> all, all that stuff. There are so many different ways to define success. And however we define success is also going to influence what we think is important, how we look, how other people think about us, um, how we dance, what we achieve. And what you think is important is going to dictate not only what you focus on, but how you feel about yourself. If your measure of success or sorry, definition of success is being the best dancer in the room, number one, recognize you're not fully in control of that. Yeah. You could try to be, but it's probably not that worth your time to mm -hmm. 
try to always look around and be like, what is she doing? How do I be better? You know, maybe it serves you a little bit. There's like a tiny usefulness to that. There's going to be a lot of negative side effects though. So when you're aware of something like that, then you could probably be aware of like, okay, well, how does that change what I value? What you're probably valuing is status to feel good about yourself. Mm -hmm. If you feel like you measure up in a way where you feel better than other dancers, then it's like, okay, check, I can feel good about myself. But again, you're not totally in control of that outcome because some other new dancer might waltz in or get moved up from a lower level and they're a child prodigy. And then what, does your self-esteem just go out the window with that? You know, I always Mm -hmm. encourage dancers to, why I said um, be thoughtful about how you want to measure success and what you want to deem is important, which is a way that you're going to measure that success is that when we choose a measure of success or multiple that are actually within our reach, meaningful and sustainable, it really leads to a lot more mental well-being and confidence. So maybe your teacher is promoting this environment where the measure of success you feel they're pushing is be perfect, as in, you know, be professional level in your dancing. Maybe you want that for yourself. Maybe you don't. Maybe that standard isn't really helpful for you because you're a student. You're not yet a professional. So you need some space to be imperfect, to experiment and to grow. Okay, that's that's healthy. So you can recognize what you, how your environment or teachers might be measuring success and question if that's working for you. And then pick a new measure of success to, sorry, I keep saying measure. <laughs> I can get so in the weeds with this. I probably don't need to. (laughs) But definition of success, like, for example, a great sustainable one and a reachable one for so many dancers is, um, let's say, for me, a way that I define success now, well, no, now I dance very recreationally. So maybe let me pick something more relatable. One definition of success I used to have when I was dancing professionally was that if I really tapped into the value of what I have to offer and just shared some of that every day. So I got clear with myself about what are my favorite aspects of my dancing? What do I feel I can add to the spaces I'm dancing in? And if I just felt like I brought that, not perfectly, but some throughout my day, that was enough for me. And I decided that was enough for me. And that also connected to what I felt was important, which is, I wanted to, um, I wanted to give as an artist, I wanted to give like encouragement or add beauty to the spaces that I was in and see how that would really shift my focus away from what do they think? Am I better than her? Is my director happy? You know, those things matter, but hopefully that made sense. It's just kind of like Mm -hmm. personalizing how you define success and what you value. Yeah. I think, you know, kind of the big thing that I heard from that is, regardless of what the environment has set, what your instructor or director has set, Mm -hmm. you still have the power to create those definitions for yourself. Definitely. That you can choose to live up to rather than whatever you're hearing Mm -hmm. in the environment that maybe Mm -hmm. isn't serving well for you. Yeah, totally. Because if we just follow the flow of what a lot of people think is important in the dance world, we will end up like them maybe overly image conscious, vain, not doing super well and kind of unhappy. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) obviously that's a huge, huge broad brush, but in the dance world, that's a quite common experience. Yeah. Yeah. So do we really want to follow that flow and be quote unquote normal? I would, for myself, I answer no. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would agree with that too. You know, even in the swing dancing space, some of my friends and people that I've met over time, like they can get so hung up on competition and how they're placing. And, you know, well, I went to this event and you went Mm -hmm. to this little one, or, you know, there can be a lot of status that comes with a lot of things, or I only dance with this level of dancer and not lower levels of dance and that kind of stuff. It's like, that does not seem like a happy place to live. No, I I like where I live. I'm good. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, totally. (laughs) So I think this is an excellent opportunity for us for a special segment on the show. (music) 
So we have the final bow. This is essentially your take home message. In this past hour or so, we've talked about lots of different things. We've had some items more for the dancers, some more for the dance teachers or people in a leadership position. Um, But what would you say if people walked away with one tidbit from this episode, what do you hope they walk away with? I'd say a sense of curiosity to explore what mentalities might not be working for them as a teacher or as a dancer or whatever you do. Just I'd encourage anyone to look at the results or behaviors, thoughts or feelings they're consistently having that they don't like. Um, And then use a sense of curiosity to ask more about where's that coming from? If it changed, how would I want it to be different? what new way of thinking or being could help me get more towards what I want. Um, That curiosity and experimental attitude is always something I'm a huge advocate for, especially since in my own journey, um, that curiosity alone got me really far in my personal growth, you know, in overcoming a lot of uh, mental and emotional challenges I experienced in the path before I got any sort of certification in coaching or learned about psychology. So I truly believe anyone can use that to great benefit. Yeah, I love that. So then the last thing is the shameless plug. So this is your opportunity (laughs) to plug anything that you want for yourself. Have at it. Yeah, thank you. So um, in terms of free content, I am on YouTube and my podcast on YouTube. I'm the confident dancer. That's my YouTube channel name. And I also have the confident dancer podcast, which is essentially my YouTube videos also put in uh, podcast form for those of you who just want to listen and maybe you're commuting or something like that. Um, I share weekly episodes on all topics surrounding dance culture and mindset, like how dancers can overcome certain things from self-doubt, um, increase their confidence, overcome perfectionism, comparison, performance anxiety, all sorts of things like that. Um, I'm also on Instagram, Kirsten underscore the confident dancer is my handle and I share daily tips there. So you can connect with me there. And also if anyone is interested in uh, individual coaching, I definitely love to help dancers individually through all those mental challenges that I just explained and really with the goal of helping dancers develop a mindset that helps them perform to their fullest potential with joy and confidence, you know, because I know a lot of dancers who have one or the other, maybe they're dancing really well, but their inner world is a different story or they feel okay, but they're like, why do I keep hitting this wall? (laughs) Maybe it's mental blocks around certain steps or whatever it is. So that uh, the confident dancer coaching program is my individual coaching program. So dancers can visit my website, theconfidentdancer.com and um, learn more about it, schedule a free consultation, just to connect and see if we're a good fit for working together. It's no strings attached. So I always welcome dancers to reach out just if they're even curious about what coaching could do for them. Um, and if any studio owners or teachers are listening and you'd be interested in having me speak at your studio, your company, university, whatever, um, I offer in-person or virtual workshops on these topics. Um, I do mindset seminars, so I love doing those. So all that is on my website, theconfidentdancer.com. Awesome. Well, I'll definitely make sure that all of those things are linked so people can find you that much more easily. And I definitely recommend that people go and check out some of these different resources. I was skimming through some of the different YouTube videos and things too. And it's like, Ooh, that one's good. And (laughs) nice snippets of different ideas and tips and uh, discussions on stuff. So it's really easily consumable information as well. So go check it out if you're a dancer. Well, thank you, Alyssa. I really appreciate it. I've really enjoyed our conversation. So thank you for having me on. Yeah, thanks so much for being on here. Dance Med Spotlight is hosted and produced by Alyssa Arms. We discuss all things dance medicine. This has been another episode from Dance Med Spotlight. The Dance Med Spotlight is intended for educational purposes only. No clinical decision making should be based solely on one source. While care is taken to ensure accuracy, factual errors can be present.